Hello, everyone, and welcome back to World Regional Geography. We're going to be diving into um, Chapter 4, a little different from your authors, uh, your textbook. I think they have uh, this section of Chapter 5 and probably a different title than, than I have. I've been doing this since 2007 and always... Uh, had this in the same spot, chapter four, and um, same title, Russia and um, neighboring countries, and we're leaving, we left Europe, and now we're heading, we're heading east, right? Uh, kind of Eurasia now, still in Europe, um, maybe a little bit more on that today, uh, but we're heading east, and you can turn to page uh, 148 in your textbooks, regardless of what the title says in your textbook or what chapter we're on, we uh, are coming to a uh, relevant section as um, we are, yeah, again, yeah, we're moving eastward as far as the, uh, as far as the headlines go. Uh, first, um, it was the so-called um, Trump-Russia collusion scandal, right, back in the 2016 through I guess 2019, three years, there was a right um, investigation on that, that scandal. And uh, now we got the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, hopefully um, we can shed a little light on, on, um, on those tensions as we um, make it through the material this week. And uh, some of it, which... Um, may be related to the U.S. Um, uh, and I don't know how much, uh, but uh, there might be something there. I don't, and I don't, but I, maybe I shouldn't spoil, be a spoiler that way. I don't know how much time I'm going to be able to uh, delve into that without getting off of the lanes of uh, my objectives for this chapter. There's also a saying out there that, <clears throat> Uh, I can't do justice to it. You, you'll hear people say that, meaning one cannot bring out the um, the best effect. And in many cases, uh, this relates to uh, telling a story, right? So we're coming also in a section where I, I always feel that way uh, with a particular part of this section. Primarily, I kind of set myself up for this because I choose to uh, highlight the Cold War years uh, related to um, studying this region and the subsequent changes. Um, the magnitude of the, of the Cold War, it, it just cannot be overstated. Uh, it included some high stakes drama, for example, a Cuban Missile Crisis uh, and a constant, constant chess match between the two superpowers that um, also, you know, habitually left a distinct anxiety lift, uh, lurking, lurking in the um, backs of the minds of those here in the in the West. Uh, and to add to the anxiety, <clears throat> when the 1980s uh, emerged, the U.S. was ar maybe arguably losing the Cold War, right? Maybe getting out foxed and. So thus, at that time, if you were to tell an American that the Soviet Union would somehow um, cease to exist in their lifetime, we would find that uh, unbelievable, unfathomable, uh, right? We wouldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to fathom that. Uh, therefore, a good chunk of the scene uh, I'm going to set up will be related to the how the unthinkable uh, happened. Uh, rather quickly, rather quickly, actually, but not without the effects of the existence of Soviet communism on the rest of the region, including including R Russia today. OK, so, um, yeah, you get out, hopefully you have your lecture models out. Um, at this uh, particular juncture. And uh, let's see. Here we go. Chapter four, Russia and the neighboring countries. And uh, in this chapter, I guess I'll start with the objectives first. Uh, we want to trace the region's history, right? That's always interesting. 
a cool thing to do. When examine the reasons behind the collapse of the Soviet Union, so big, it was so huge. Your generation, you know, rightly so, it's not your fault. You don't really understand that. It was a totally different world um, from one day to the next. Uh, get a sense of how population patterns play into the region's role in uh, today's globalized world and uh, recognize the effects of the Soviet era again on the CIS, the common independent Commonwealth of Independent States and the neighboring states of Russia at the present time. Major heads up terms here on the CIS, Commonwealth of Independent States. Those independent states are the states that broke off, got their independence from the Soviet Union, from Russia, uh, at the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Rus, uh, Rus is um, an ancient people who um, were, um, I guess, arguably gave uh, their name to the lands of of uh, Russia and uh, Bel neighboring Belarus. And uh, there's really no small amount of disagreement uh, on their origins and uh, and identity as a result. Muscovy. Muscovy is, um, you know, uh, Moscow, right? Moscow, early name of um, that uh, particular area, Moscow, capital of Russia. Uh, annexation. Annexation is... Basically, where you, one country takes the territory of a neighboring country. It's kind of attached to it. Okay, annexation. Uh, the USSR, the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic. We spend a lot of, well, spending some considerable amount of time on that. The five-year plans. Russia was, uh, so Russia uh, was the political nerve center of the Soviet Union, and uh, it was a kind of industrial backwater at best, very agricultural. Um, the second Secretary General of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, looked to take Rush, take the Soviet Union into an industrial age, and he did this through what he called the five year plans. More on that in a few minutes. Uh, the Iron Curtain, of course, um, once the bombing stopped, the shooting stopped at World War II, um, the Soviet Union was uh, stationed in the middle of Europe and um, they wanted a communist existence. Uh, the French, the British, the Americans, democracies and free markets. And, you know, so... Um, Soviets and uh, the West agreed to set up a line of demarcation. Uh, the countries to the east of that line would uh, fall into the Soviet bloc, right? Uh, Winston Churchill um, dubbed that imaginary line the an ideological name. We have a we have an iron curtain, he said, of um, um, you know, ideology separating two worlds here in Europe of the East and West. And that comes to um, basically polarizing the entire, most of the globe, right, for about 50 years. You know, some people were, some countries were client states to the Soviet, some uh, client states to the U.S. and the West. And, uh, you know, hence the chess match, the vying for uh, a balance of power, right, globally. Gulags, gulags were um, the um, major production centers of Soviet communism. Um, those who were deemed to be enemies of the state were placed in gulags. Um, I don't, I don't believe your author has a, a visual of that where all the where all the gulags were. Many, many, many. Uh, many were out in the eastern part of um, modern-day Russia, Siberia, and uh, basically work camps 
uh, just cruel, hard work camps and a lot of um, uh, production goods that um, went around Russia and the rest of the Soviet Union was uh, produced there for the political prisoners. Perestroika and Glasnost, um, more on this when we get to it, but um, as um, the Reagan administration comes into office, uh, they began to uh, challenge the Soviet Union. They look, they see some cancers within the system. They begin to try to exploit those. And uh, the uh, new Secretary General, Mikhail Gorbachev, kind of recognizes what was going on. And he looks to enact some Western reforms, Western economic reforms in perestroika and um, just information, more informational openness uh, with, uh, with Glasnost. And um, people started tasting some freedoms. And this is, you know, one of the cogs in the wheel that brought, brought down the Soviet Union. Southern Caucasus, the um, uh, Southern Caucasus are um, an area in uh, you know the southern part of the Soviet Union, and um, you had uh, it was you know rich in minerals, rich in minerals and and um, tropical, semi-tropical uh, fruits and vegetables, and um, you know very important um, important area for um, the um, you know the Soviet machine as were other areas too. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the uh, Southern Caucasus uh, than uh, some of the other areas. Just not enough time, right? All right, let's take a look at this. And um, New World, last day of the year, 1991, the um, Commonwealth of Independent Country States, countries emerged from the Soviet collapse. Uh, the difference between Russia and the European empires is that the, the Russians would uh, annex territory, right? They would annex territory uh, from nearby, picking it off nearby and uh, adjacent to the Soviet Union uh, rather than uh, land overseas, right? Uh, for example, they extended their borders from, uh, you know, from neighboring states. And when the, uh, when the Cold War was underway, um, that was kind of a public relations problem uh, for the um, for the West because uh, the United States, compared to England and France, uh, didn't seem as uh, onerous with their Western imperialism as some of the other European countries because we hadn't been around as long for one. But we didn't we didn't jump into the land grabbing game until maybe the Spanish American War. But I say all that to say that uh, when it came to uh, currying favor with the Third World, right? Third World had a lot of natural resources that certainly the Soviets needed, and we didn't want those areas falling into the hands of the Soviets. Um, the Soviets could say, "Hey, look, look around the globe. It's the West." It's these Western democracies that have imperialized and colonized areas around the globe, not us. Soviets would do that, or the Russians did that, you know, uh, in nearby countries, hence the amalgamation of the Soviet Union. But, you know, kind of a slight public relations problem for the West. Rus, 800s, the uh, Varangians. Um, in Russia, or in Russian, that's the way you would say, uh, um, say it, uh, these were Vikings, right? Vikings moved into um, the uh, North European plain uh, via the uh, Volga River. Uh, Novgorod and Kiev, Kiev's in the headlines a lot these days, the capital of the Ukraine, two of the most important principalities between 900 and 1000 AD. And they both adopt the Eastern Orthodox Christian uh, religion. From the East, you have the uh, the Mongols, 
and they established the uh, the uh, Shanet of the uh, of the Golden Horde. It's a steppe land of um, Central um, Central Asia and Siberia. They're established in those areas about uh, the twelve hundreds. Muscovy, Muscovy, Moscow emerges as an important principality in Muscovy. Muscovy, maybe a a, 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 um, a provincial area, and as a result uh, of uh, Muscovy and Moscow's locale on a uh, trade route between the Baltic and the Black Seas, it becomes significant. Kind of again moving very broadly here on the timeline. Down. The Soviet Union. Okay. The Soviet Union fast forwarding. Or the Russian Empire. I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead here. The Russian Empire. I was say, Peter the Great's got to get in there. Uh, after Muscovy, we're fast forwarding, not as far as the Soviet Union, but um, briefly, we're talking about the Russian Empire and uh, Peter the Great. Uh, he founded St. Petersburg while attempting to westernize the country. And then uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union, the Bolsheviks, under the uh, authority of Vladimir Lenin, they established the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics in 1922. The Bolshevik Revolution uh, takes place against the Tsarist government in uh, 1917. Takes about five years, and as a result of that, uh, the Soviets um, kind of jut out of World War One to um, tend to their their Bolshevik revolution, their communist revolution. Uh, Lenin dies in the nineteen twenties. Uh, Joseph Stalin uh, takes over the reins of the Soviet Union, and you have the five year plans. Uh, this was Joseph Stalin's attempt to help commercialize. Uh, the farmers helped them learn communism uh, based on industrial industrialization. Get them in the factories, right? Start industrializing the country. And then your small farmers will uh, kind of merge together to create large farms. See, your commercial farmers were capitalists, right? You could not have that, right? Stalin and, uh, and the Bolsheviks, um, they saw that as a, a great evil, capitalism. So you take the um, you know you take the commercial farmers, put them in the factories. We can keep watch on who they what they're doing. You know they're not stirring any up any dissent, and uh, they're helping. Uh, they're learning industrial uh, industrialization and helping to industrialize the Soviet Union. So the government right becomes the uh, employers. Uh, while the commercial farmers become the factory workers. Now, during World War II, right, during World War II, um, the Soviets in the West teamed up to defeat the Nazis. Uh, when the bombing stopped, the Soviet Red Army was in the middle of Europe. Soviets demanded that those countries become satellites of their empire to buffer it from Western aggression. And uh, this became known as the Iron Curtain. Global changes and um, local responses. Now, the Soviets closed off their um, society from the capitalist world. The Soviets, as a result of being closed, uh, the world really did not see the inherent weaknesses within. Uh, inefficiencies, struggles to keep up with an arms race, and with um, inequalities. One of the things the Soviets would do, um, they would, they had year-round paid hockey players or wrestlers or gymnasts, and uh, where when they got involved in the Olympics, um, one they were more populous because of how big the Soviet Union was, but um, they were basically playing against amateurs. That's before professionals could. I think it happened in the early 90s, maybe, when professionals uh, were able to compete in the Olympics. But, you know, for decades, um, the Soviets just dominated, just dominated the uh, Olympics. And, um, you know, 
as a young kid growing up, uh, to me, uh, that was kind of scary, you know, about their um, so-called power. But they kind of closed themselves off. We'll get to this in a real short uh, minute here. Closed themselves off from the world. And you couldn't see uh, maybe some of the weaknesses, the hidden weaknesses. Enter the um, Cold War and the arms race in the 1980s. So in, 19, in, in March of 85, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev takes over. He comes to power and he sees the empire kind of crumbling with within and starts introducing some Western reforms. Uh, perestroika, uh, that was economic restructuring and basically taking on Western free market reforms. All right, and glasnost, glasnost informational openness. And what he, what he does here is he separates the economy from politics while he's introducing some Western style reforms. The U.S. role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Ronald Reagan enters office in um, 1981, and uh, his top aides saw inherent weaknesses in the Soviet system. And here was the thing. Here was the big thing. They knew that the Soviets were spending almost their entire gross domestic product on military. So the Reagan administration, they kind of escalated the arms race, and it scared people here. They're like, "What are you, you know, what are you doing?" Um, but Reagan and top lieutenants, they were doing this on purpose, forcing the Soviets to make democratic and free market reforms. In fact, when Reagan took office, not only was he doing that, but he was saying things like he was calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, the source of all evil in the world. And he's saying, hey, we're not going to talk with them until we can do it from a position of strength. And people were like, well, you got to talk with them. You got to have talks. And he said, we're not going to do it because they lie and they cheat anyway. So uh, Reagan was approaching the Soviet Union in a way that we had not seen before. It was uh, really it was a big time hardball. And uh, Reagan wanted to cut taxes and regulations to stimulate the economy to pay for the arms race, which they did. Uh, by 1983, we had the largest peacetime economy in our nation's history because of the tax cuts and the, the cuts in the regulations. And the, um, you know, the private sector was doing really well, but so was, you know, in military spending. So the Reagan administration kind of forced Gorbachev into perestroika and glasnost because the communist economy was just tanking, right? Um, also, the Reagan administration began to broadcast Western propaganda into Russia and East Europe via Radio Free Europe, which uh, hastened unrest among the, amongst the people as well. So people are getting a taste of freedom. They're hearing about freedom, even more freedom. And it's um, right. It's just causing a groundswell of um of uh dissent uh this leads to the fall of the berlin wall in 1990 and then um something that none of us alive at that time growing up uh as well never thought we'd see the last day of december 1991 the statue of um joseph stalin was taken down and the soviet union uh, dissolved so so dramatic uh, that was so today the Soviet Union it's um, debatable whether Russia is um, you know still a world power uh, they are, are on the UN Security Council and they are a member of the G8 that's a group of the world's wealthiest countries um, strong nuclear power, right? Strong nuclear power. However, you know, 14, 15% of the country still lives in, in poverty. Um, transformation to democracy and capitalism after the collapse um, has, uh, uh, has not been easy. So let's take a look at that. After the Soviet collapse, we're looking now 
1991 to 1999, um, guy named Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin, I call this Boris Yeltsin's shock therapy, right? You're coming out of centuries of czarist rule and decades of communist rule and, um, you know, free markets and democracy. I mean, it's not going to be an easy, it's not going to be an easy jump. It's not going to be a small leap or an easy, easy jump doing this. So the sixth largest economy in the world, but but a small uh, gross domestic product, GDP and a low um, uh, human index, right? low HDI. That's kind of like a, like a quality of life measure. We looked at that a couple chapters back. This funnels out, as I say here, to Russia being labeled as a a misdeveloped country. And I probably should have had this on the heads up terms. Misdeveloped country, look about that. That's kind of a halfway point between a developing country, a poor country, and you know the wealthier developed countries. Uh, only Russia's oligarchs really benefited right during the 1990s you're leading you're leading business people and um they were able to gain this leverage as a uh, as a result of buying up what were once safe you know uh controlled sectors of the economy so in essence uh they uh, controlled about 70% of the russian economy in the 90s and by 2020 about half that wealth uh, was offshore. So a favorite a favorite target was the uh, real estate of London. I would just say this too about the 90s. Uh, Boris Yeltsin was, um, and I'm not trying to be irreverent, he, you know, he had problems imbibing a lot of alcohol. So at the time, our president in the 1990s from 92 to 2000 was William Jefferson Clinton. And uh, Clinton, um, I wasn't able to provide uh, the uh, proper leadership to Yeltsin. Could have maybe, but uh, the 90s, the Clintons were embroiled in um, scandals. Um, so I, you know, pretty safe to say, uh, I would argue that uh, that had a lot to do with um, maybe Yeltsin and not getting maybe some of the counsel and help that uh, he could have had. I know a couple of times when Clinton would go over there, it seemed like when they would speak, he had to maybe hold Yeltsin up because uh, Yeltsin had, uh, Yeltsin had, um, you know, down a little too much vodka or something. So uh, Vladimir Putin, enter, enter Vladimir Putin in 2000. He, um, Usher, the oligarchs really usher him in. Uh, his approval ratings among Russians is is high. Uh, they like his, believe it or not, they like his authoritarian style. It's uh, fairly attractive. Uh, it's you know I think it's reminiscent of the uh, of the former Soviet days that are maybe romanticized now to the younger generations. Uh, the older generation, you know, your World War II generation and uh, your boomers are, you know, not, they want nothing to do with those days, but your younger generation, you know, your millennials and maybe Gen Z, maybe some Gen X, right? That's so attractive uh, uh, to some. Uh, a 2020 referendum has allowed Putin to run Russia until 2036. So, hmm, right? Uh, to enhance position and cause um, discord elsewhere, the Russians uh, invest uh, in uh, internet trolls, right? Uh, bots in the thousands to uh, sow discord on news websites and social media platforms. Uh, the end goal, why? Uh, to weaken the trust of folk in each other, as well as government and media. Putinomics. here 
Putinomics, the um, 2000s saw Russia's economy flourish as it exported gas and other natural resources. Uh, the wealth accumulation lasted until Russia's takeover of Crimea in 2014. Now, Crimea is a big source of contention with the um, with the Russians and the Ukrainians right now. Um, for a visual, uh, I would advise that in your books, you turn to page 179, figure 529, I think it is. And you can see the Crimea area is um, stationed, you know, in the sea, right? So it's a, it's a strategic port. I mean, here's the thing about Crimea too. Probably at least half of it, maybe, maybe even more. They are Russian speaking, right? So uh, they're you know, pro-Russian, if you will. Uh, energy prices, after that happened, um, energy prices uh, in, the, in that region collapsed the following year. Um, so with such a wealth of uh, natural resources, there is a weakness of uh, diversification in manufacturing and high-tech industries. Uh, part of the problem, part of that problem is the brain drain after the uh, collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. So um, you have an emphasis on education that began to decline in the 1970s as a result of this. Thus, salaries declined in those, um, those fields, prompting the exodus of a lot of people uh, in, uh, in those careers. Human rights, I want to take a look at um, that on your lecture model, human rights. Under Joseph Stalin, the Soviets set up labor camps called the, uh, called the gulags. Uh, gulags were formed for economic development. Uh, farmers who did not abide by the uh, collectivist practices, the communist practices were placed in the gulags. Uh, forced to work in coal, copper, gold mines. About 3 million people died there. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote two books about this. He was in prison uh, for criticizing Stalin. Uh, he did win a Nobel Peace Prize for his book, uh, The Gulag Archipelago. And I, I'm kind of looking at that over in my bookcase. I wanted to bring that over and you know, flash it around for a couple seconds and forgot to do that. Uh, probably no big deal. Uh, figure 415, page uh, 158. Let me just see if um, that's what I want you guys to turn to. And I um, was hoping maybe this had the, um, yeah, maybe a, where the, uh, Gulags were, but it doesn't. So forget about page 150. I mean, you could turn to page 158. Um, I'm not going to stop you, but it doesn't look like, look like there's anything there that um, I wanted you to um, see. All right. Real quickly, uh, I want to just um, talk about the um, the land forms. And um, here, um, well, let's look here, page Page 150 and one, yeah, page 150 and 151 will suffice for a visual here. Um, right. Gives you a map and some uh, geographic keys there. The uh, Russian and neighboring countries region is uh, the world's largest, right, in terms of land area. I think I counted one time, 12 time zones from east to west. Uh, the vast size and the northerly location result in uh, large expanses of uh, mid-latitude continental interior climates with uh, right, particularly harsh, uh, harsh winters. Um, the plains are interrupted by the Ural Mountains and the low hills that uh, dominate the western half of the region. Then you have your, your low plateaus and mountains that dominate the east and 
there are very long rivers uh, in uh, in the region, but many of these rivers flow northward, and so they remain frozen uh, during much of the year. Uh, vegetation and soil regions uh, follow the patterns of the climates with tundra and coniferous forest, your, your taiga in the north, kind of the biome, if you will, of the, uh, the uh, needle leaf trees. And uh, then you have the um, deciduous forest, um, the steppe and desert in the south. And the, the best agricultural conditions are uh, the steppe grasslands, uh, where the black earth or the uh, chernozem uh, soils are found. Uh, pollution's been a problem in many parts of the region, particularly in areas uh, when experienced rapid industrialization during the um, during the Soviet era. Uh, contraction of the Aral Sea, the result of water diversion um, for agriculture in Central Asia continues to be uh, one of the uh, arguably one of the world's uh, greatest environmental uh, disasters. So where do I want to go next here with this? Um, yeah, let me um, take a look at um, the Russian Federation, otherwise known as um, you know the political state of Russia. It uh, consists of about 89 political units. And you can take a look at uh, figure 523, page 174 for a visual. Um, and um, I think that's about all I'll talk about with that. I want to move to geopolitical issues with Russia as we finish up here. So what's going on today? I... Geopolitical. There we go. Um, you have autonomous republics, right? Autonomous republics uh, within, um, you know, within Russia. And you think, well, Moscow is probably ruling with a heavy hand over everything. Well, actually, um, the various republics, the various districts have an awful lot of freedom. I mean, they can establish official languages, um, uh, draft constitutions, uh, pass laws uh, in conflict, even with the federal government as well, surprising that sounds. And as I'd mentioned the Crimean War in 2014 was also uh, parts of it added to Russia. Um, constitutions, um, you know, are, are passed, like I said. Um, a treaty was signed by Moscow and the republics regarding autonomy. I think this was 1992. All right. So it was about eight years before Putin took office, about a year after the Soviet Union collapsed under the Yeltsin era. Uh, but here's the thing, many of these areas contain important minerals. So the promise by Moscow, uh, the promises by Moscow to keep their hands off of the, you know, out of the um, grill of these republics has been in dispute. Uh, they did invade uh, Chechnya uh, back in the uh, 2000s, I believe it was, late 90s. Uh, who sought to break away in a Muslim dominated uh, dominated region and who were not saints. I mean, they were conducting some terrorist activity. Uh, in 2000, uh, Putin began rolling back uh, uh, some appointments. Uh, regional affairs are now controlled by local people, but loyalists of uh, Putin, right? You get it. You get the picture. And but he, uh, well, but there has been pushback. There has been pushback across the country against some of this heavy uh, handedness. So as far as the Russians are concerned, the former Soviet republics are what they call the near abroad. Looks like a good quiz question if I don't say so. The near abroad is a zone uh, in which Russia feels compelled to exert its exert its special interests uh, and influence. So turn to page 174, figure 523. 
Uh, you can see um, a nice couple nice visuals about this. But what about geopolitics in the near abroad? Well, big question a lot of us have is uh, what does Putin want? What does Vladimir Putin want? Well, he wants a buffer zone, just as his forefathers did, right? Uh, Trotsky and Lenin, you know, at the Bolshevik Revolution, the Iron Curtain and Stalin. They wanted a buffer from the evil capitalist West, right? And they want access at the same time to important natural resources and, and economic assets of the former Soviet republics. I guess Putin feels as, as his, you know, a former um, former communist uh, leaders did in the Soviet era, kind of vulnerable. You know, if you take a look at the map of Europe and the Soviet and, and Russia, he's probably he's kind of sitting in the middle of a rolling plain between Siberia out in the east and um, France in the west, right? And this was really the reason um, behind the Warsaw Pact, you know, the Soviet bloc during the um, during the Cold War era. However, there are no longer any Soviet satellite countries. So you have incursions and invasions have, that have served to uh, energize an organization um, spearheaded by Russia. And they have set up now a uh, organization called the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the STO. Now on page 176, figure 525, we got some visuals again um, connected to this, these points. So you got important natural and economic resources of the former Soviet republics. So you uh, got the um, Black Sea coast and Crimea. Um, in industrial resources in eastern Ukraine, uh, uranium in uh, the former Soviet Republic of um, Tajikistan, you got aviation plants and a vital, vital oil pipeline uh, in the uh, Caucasus, the Southern Caucasus, and uh, Georgia would be one of those uh, countries uh, of which it was uh, late 2000s. Putin invaded Georgia and took parts of Georgia, which was um, pretty much Russian, Russian dominated. And there are military factories in Moldova too, a former Soviet Republic. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, could become one of the world's leading oil producers. Uh, the question remains if they can exploit those fields. Uh, the region was limited by the um, Soviets to develop industry in order to keep the people of Azerbaijan depend, dependent on the um, Russians and other Soviet republics. Uh, figure 533 on page 187, I think has an inset map there of these countries I'm talking about. And here's the, you know, as we start, the, we, as we hit the home stretch here of today's lecture, Russia is committing it committed to um, preventing the CIS, the, Com the Commonwealth of Independent States, from joining NATO, right? NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, right? We looked at this earlier, designed to a military organization of Western countries designed to keep the you know, Soviets from encroaching in Europe and elsewhere. Well, Soviets... I mean, that's like taking Dracula to the cross, right? NATO, as far as the Soviets are concerned. So they are um, just dead set against uh, any of the CIS countries, the former Soviet republics, uh, joining NATO. Uh, however, a dozen have done so, right, as, I, as we speak. Which leads up to my final point today, Russia. Russia's uh, moves on the Ukraine, all right? This answers some more questions, all right? Why Ukraine? Well, I'm touching on some of that. If you look at the map, they're right up against, they're right on the doorstep of uh, Russia, right? So um, that's one reason why 
uh, Putin is dead set against the Ukrainians uh, joining NATO. So Ukraine, it's um, blessed with um, black earth soils. It's uh, agriculturally productive. It was uh, back during the Soviet era when it was part of the Soviet Union. It was kind of known as the breadbasket, right? The breadbasket because there's a lot, they you know, growing tons of wheat there, right? Coal and iron as uh, industrial raw material. Uh, discrimination via fossil fuel was used as an endowment, uh, as a carrot and stick. Uh, toward the uh, former republics through Russia's gas giant, Gazprom, right? Gazprom, uh, G-A-Z-P-R-O-M, G-A-Z-P-R-O-M. And then, of course, special intent, the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula, figure 526. Uh, and then when you take a look at the map, the Crimean Peninsula, you have the uh, Kerch Strait, which is very important. It's a passageway to the Black Sea. And um, and it's also, um, as is the uh, port of uh, Sevastopol. Now, the Euro Maiden Revolution, the Euro Maiden Revolution, I think I may have these, I, I do, I have these spellings on the heads up terms. Um, probably didn't cover some of those terms as far as I, I should have, but I do have these on the heads up terms. Uh, the Euro Maiden Revolutions, pro-Western, was a pro-Western president that was installed. Um, and it basically, it was an un unconstitutional coup spearheaded from arguably the United States White House in 2013. Um, again, that region, a lot of pro-Russians a lot of Russian speakers, and it was a, it was a um, democratically elected president who was pro-Russian, and um, a coup, which uh, you know, Mr. Zelensky of the Ukraine was uh, was involved in as well, uh, ousted this democratically elected president uh, out of office. So, you know, looking at this from Vladimir Putin's perspective. It's like, look, we did what, you know, you you guys in the West say we should be doing, you know, having democratic elections. It's just that your guy didn't win. So, and then, you know, there's speculation on why, um, you know, the Obama White House uh, was involved, if they were, in, um, you know, this coup to oust this leader. Soon thereafter, Russia made its move on Crimea, right? That led to the Crimean War. Uh, the closer the West to the West, the former satellite states get, the more disturbing this gets to Russia, right? Again, leading to the invasion of Crimea. Some European countries are leery of squeezing Putin too hard as they've grown dependent on Russia's natural gas. You should probably say too about Gazprom, getting back to that, it's the leading producer of natural gas in the world, right? And um, as a result, some of our allies in Europe are, um, you know, dependent on, on or, or more dependent on than we would like on Putin via Gazprom. So anyway, there's been intense fighting and in, in, uh, there was intense fighting in Crimea from you know, 2014, 2015, I think it was a brief uptick again in 2017. And as we know, on the 24th of February, 2022, Russia began its invasion into, um, into Eastern Ukraine. Okay, your graphic organizer is... Um, you know, up and uh, you can download that. We look today at um, Russia and neighboring countries. Um, you know, the new world begins. 1992, Commonwealth of Independent States emerges, former Soviet republics, um, Soviet Union, 
you know, annexed territory. Uh, the Russians annexed territory, forming the Soviet Union, the size of it. Um, Moscovy becomes a you know, the capital today, emerges because it's, you know, in a um, strategic area where trade routes, uh, Russian Empire, uh, Peter the Great looks to westernize, uh, you know, Russia, which was kind of a, a backwater. Uh, you have the czarist governments for for a very long time after Peter the Great. And then they were um, kicked out of power, right? The Bolshevik communist revolution under uh, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, Joseph Stalin takes over after Lenin's death. He introduces industrialization. There are five-year plans. Um, there's the Iron Curtain, the ideological line between the Eastern Communist bloc and um, Western democracies, right, in uh, 1945. You know, closed off from the world, human rights abuses via the gulags, uh, inefficiencies, inequalities. Uh, Gorbachev um, looks to save the system through perestroika, economic restructuring, and glasnost, informational openness. Yeah, I, I remember when Reagan said he wouldn't talk to the Soviets, he took office in 81. Gorbachev didn't take office until 1985. And uh, more on that in a, few, uh, in a minute. Uh, but um, three rulers were in power during uh, that time from between 1981 and 1985, but they were very old guys, right? The Soviets always have very old premiers, uh, secretary generals, and they just kept dying. So even if Reagan wanted to meet, wasn't a lot of time to develop things with any of those guys. Um, Soviets wisened up, and um, Kyle Gorbachev was just 53 years old when uh, he was tapped. Gorbachev died, I think, last year, very recently. Challenges from the U.S., the Reagan administration, they induce the uh, Soviets in an arms race and look to cripple them economically. And um, it's what they do. Soviet Union dissolves in December of 91 and the, communi uh, the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States emerge. Okay. Russia's economic standing, sixth largest economy, um, kind of an oligarchic, oligarchic controlled a country uh, controls about 70% of the economy. Uh, Putin's highly popular in Russia. Still, even with the uh, the war, I believe, he's taken maybe a little bit of um, uh, a hit there. But um, they, you know, the Russian uh, tech community, they, they, along with the government, uh, engage in a lot of internet trolling. Uh, Putinomics, uh, a lot of brain drain has left after the Soviet collapse. Uh, kind of weakened the country. Uh, energy prices have collapsed after the invasion of Crimea, and the economy um, has gotten better uh, after uh, in the two thousands. So geopolitics within Russia, you have uh, autonomous republics uh, via a nineteen ninety two treaty, uh, kind of getting rolled back a little bit by Putin. Uh, the near abroad, right? Those areas of Russia's. The Russia wants to preserve for its own interests. They need it to serve as a buffer zone. Uh, important resources from the former Soviet republics are there. Uh, Russia is uh, committed to keeping NATO away from these former republics. And then Russia's moves on the Ukraine. You know, it's got Black Sea access, uh, coal and iron, wheat, big wheat producer. Okay. And there you have it. What is um, coming up? A couple of videos. Um, and again, I'm watching the, um, yeah, I'm looking at the discussion questions. And um, I could tell who's looking at, who's doing some of the short readings or looking at the videos. And um, it kind of comes into play with the grades of the discussion questions because I don't want freelancing, okay? Um, Reagan Gorbachev, the videos. I'm uh, going to have to probably spend a little more time with this one here than most videos, if not all of the ones I show in this course. 
the Reagan Gorbachev videos, you got to see those, not just for the grade, going to have some quiz questions on them, but, and they're short videos uh, put together by PBS. Reagan does not meet with the Soviets until 1986, I believe it is. And he meets with Gorbachev and they were high stakes drama. And by that point, Gorbachev is looking to talk the Americans out of the arms race. And the arms race was centered around a missile defense shield that the Americans want, could build because of the economy was booming. It was a missile defense shield. And the, the thinking went like this way. It's like, we could bomb Moscow, they could bomb Washington, right? Well, not so much anymore with the missile shield. We could bomb Moscow, but they're not going to be able to hit us. We could bomb Moscow again. Game over, right? And uh, Gorbachev knew the communist economy just couldn't afford it. Hence, perestroika and things like that, and glasnost, to try to jumpstart the economy and perhaps get into the game of uh, the escalation of the arms race. So you got to see this. Um, and uh, Reagan pulls the line, right? And I believe it's within those summits, the beginning and the end came uh, for the Soviet Union. So yeah, watch those for more than one reason. Thursday in the news, right? By now you have the rhythm, 11.59. Friday, the initial discussion posts are due, 11.59. And then Saturday, your two responses, right? To your classmates. Monday, we have our quiz, right? Do all day, or it's open all day, do at 11.59 that night. And then we start to head um, southeast to East Asia. We're gonna be looking at China and Russia, or China and Japan and uh, the Koreas primarily. So, okay. All right, there you have it. Any questions, comments, concerns? I, as always, you guys know how to find me, right? Several ways to do that. So you guys have a fantastic week, week and uh, do well, right? Bye-bye.